like to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles this evening to Psalm 96. Psalm 96 this evening. It is a true honor and delight to be able to be with you here again this evening and to open the Word of God together. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here and appreciate so much Tim and him uh, taking me around. And uh, for, uh, unfortunately, it seems like I've worn him out a little bit. Uh, but uh, no, we'll be praying for his health and uh, just so thankful for uh, the privilege of being here this evening. And to continue, uh, for those of you who are here Friday night, and uh, continue the topic of worship. This is an important topic. And this evening, looking at what I believe to be a particularly poignant psalm that will help us to focus on singing in worship. It has always been a characteristic of God's people that they are a singing people. This was Paul's admonition when he commanded Christians in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5 to sing. Early church leaders and pastors emphasized the importance of singing. The leaders of the Reformation, like Martin Luther, continued to emphasize the importance of singing. Martin Luther said, we have put this music to the living and holy word of God in order to sing, praise, and honor it. We want the beautiful art of music to be properly used to serve her dear creator and his Christians. He is thereby praised and honored, and we are made better and stronger in faith when his holy word is impressed upon our hearts by sweet music. And yet, God's people have also recognized throughout the history of the church that since music can be abused... We must always look to Scripture to guide us in understanding why we sing in worship and what this singing ought to be like. And there are, of course, many places in the Word of God that we could look to give us principles that should inform our practice of singing, but there is perhaps no better a source of such guidance than the God-inspired collection of songs, the book of Psalms. This is why, despite the fact that most Christians throughout church history have written new songs and and sung hymns in their churches, all Christians have emphasized the Old Testament Psalms as the source and standard for what we sing. And so it is to this psalm, Psalm 96, that I would like to direct our attention this evening, and I believe it will help us to discern principles that would guide our singing today. So let's look together at this psalm, Psalm 96. David writes, O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Psalm 96 was placed by the editors of the Psalms in a series of Psalms, in book four of the Psalms, that are unified by a common poetic genre and theme. Psalm 93 through 100 are often referred to as enthronement Psalms, since their central message is affirmation of God's kingly reign over all things, his sovereignty. And this psalm in particular is an enthronement psalm directly connected to corporate worship. This psalm was originally written by King David 
on the occasion of bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the tabernacle in Jerusalem. You'll recall that the Philistines had captured the Ark years earlier, and it was only during David's reign that he successfully returned it to its proper place in the tabernacle. First Chronicles Chapter 16 records the service of dedication that Israel held in honor of the event. David appointed musicians to play and to sing during that service. And verse 7 of 1 Chronicles 16 says, Then on that day David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung unto the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. And then verses 8 through 36 of 1 Chronicles 16 records the song that he wrote and gave to them to sing. And then after that dedication service, David apparently took that song that he had written and he rearranged it into a couple of different songs that Israel then used regularly in its worship. Portions of that song in 1 Chronicles 16 appear in Psalm 105 and Psalm 106, and the song appears almost verbatim here as Psalm 96. What's also very interesting and instructive about this psalm is that in the Greek translation of this song, it indicates that the psalm was also used in the dedication of the rebuilt temple after the Hebrews returned from Babylonian exile. So think with me for a moment about those two events. The the dedication of David's tabernacle after the ark had been returned uh, to Jerusalem from the Philistines, and the dedication of the second temple after return from exile. In both of those cases, it makes sense that a psalm would be used as as an expression of praise to God, an affirmation of the sovereign reign of God over all things, particularly over the pagan nations and their gods. Now, in terms of, of genre, Psalm 96 would be classified as a hymn. A hymn is simply a song of praise in response to God's nature and works. And you can see this clearly in the structure of this psalm. For example, verses 1 through 3 are calls to worship the Lord. And then notice verses 4 through 6 describe the reasons for worship. And so that marks the first stanza of this psalm. A similar pattern is followed in the second stanza beginning in verse 7 and in the third stanza beginning in verse 11. In each case, this song is an expression of worship in response to understanding truths about God. Now, understanding that structure will help us to discern why God would have us sing this psalm or any psalm or really any song in worship for that matter. Why do we sing? I mean, there's, there's no question here that Psalm 96 is a call to sing. In fact, David emphasizes this fact by repeating the call to sing three times right at the beginning. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Now, we'll look more in a moment at what that phrase, sing to the Lord a new song, means. But I first want you simply to notice the nature of singing in this psalm. What is it? What are we doing when we sing to the Lord? Well, David communicates something of the nature of singing very clearly in how he develops the ideas of this psalm. The psalm opens with three commands to sing, 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 followed by three verbs that are set in parallel with the three commands to sing. So we have sing, 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 followed by bless, tell, and declare. David is is developing what it means to sing with with this additional set of three verbs. To sing is to bless the Lord. To sing is to tell of his salvation. To sing is to declare his glory. In fact, David uses verbs that are grouped into threes several more times through this psalm to continue to develop what it means to sing to the Lord. So let's look at the text. Where's the next grouping of three verbs? Well, look at verse 7. Ascribe, ascribe, ascribe. Three verbs again. 
This is David telling us what it means to sing to the Lord. To sing to the Lord is to ascribe to him something that he deserves, namely his glory and his strength and the glory due his name. Well, where is the next grouping of three verbs? Keep reading in verse 8. Bring an offering and then worship the Lord and then tremble before him. Again, David is putting these three verbs together in threes to help us to understand what we are doing when we sing. Well, where's the next grouping of three verbs? Look at verse 11. We read here, let, and then the the second let in there is actually not in in the Hebrew, but we find another a let in, in verse 11, and then another let. So there's, again, three lets, three verbs translated let here in our English text. These are, these are verbs that are not commanded to us directly in this case, but toward others, towards the heavens, towards the earth, towards the sea and the fields. But still, we have here a grouping of three verbs that explain the nature of the command to sing. Be glad and rejoice, roar, exult. You see, David is intentionally giving us these groupings of three verbs to expand and explore the nature of our singing. He's using parallel groupings of three to reveal that these are not just separate ideas. It's not as if he's commanding us to sing on the one hand and then separately commanding us to bless and tell and declare and ascribe and so forth as if these are just lists of things that we ought to do. No, in expressing these commands in parallel groupings of three, David is developing one central thread of interconnected ideas. He's telling us, or rather he is showing us through the poetry That when we sing, we bless the Lord. When we sing, we tell of his salvation. When we sing, we declare his glory. We ascribe to him the glory and strength due his name. We rejoice, we express, we exalt. In other words, when we sing, we are not just making music. We are not just doing something pretty or enjoyable. The verbs in these groupings reveal that when we sing, profound things are taking place. We are expressing expressing profound affections from our hearts like joy and exaltation. We are magnifying God's glory and strength. We are proclaiming what he has done. And of course, although they're not in this psalm, there are other expressions of our hearts that are communicated through singing. Things like thanksgiving and lament and contrition and praise and confession and grief and love and so many more things. In fact, singing helps us to express those things to the Lord in ways that would not be possible if we did not have songs. Singing gives us a language for the expression of our hearts when words alone would be inadequate. I mean, we we can and should certainly bless the Lord with simply words. We we can and should uh, simply uh, tell of God's salvation and declare of his glory and exalt him with just words alone. We ought to do that. But singing helps us to do that in nuanced and expansive ways that words alone cannot do. This is the power of singing. But I want you also to notice that these expressions of our hearts through singing don't exist just in a vacuum or for their own sake. Rather, what we find modeled for us in this psalm is that singing to the Lord is a response It is a response to who God is and what he has done. And again, we can see this just in the structure of the three stanzas of this hymn. There is a call to express through singing and then reasons for those expressions. A call to sing followed by reasons for those expressions and another call to sing followed by reason for singing. In fact, in two of the three stanzas, this is seen again with another grouping of three. David is deliberately, poetically doing this. Look at verse 4, for example. After the threefold call to sing and the threefold development of what that means, we find, for great is the Lord. Verse 5, 
for all of the, uh, all the gods of the peoples are worthless. And then implied in verse 6, for splendor and majesty are before him. Here we have three reasons we ought to be singing. And again, look at verse 13. We find the same thing. After a threefold call for the earth and the sea and the field to sing, we find, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth, and again implied, for he will judge the world. And although we don't find this grouping of four in the second stanza, that stanza too is filled with reasons for singing. This is very important to recognize because this is a central mark of a good hymn. A good hymn is not just an expression of emotion. It's not even just an expression of emotion directed toward God. But neither is it just a collection or recitation of facts about God. It's not just a, a group of theologically accurate statements. No, a good hymn contains both expressions of appropriate affection toward God and the theological reasons for those expressions. You see, a song that only contains descriptions of emotion can very easily devolve into sentimentalism and emotionalism. But a song that contains only statements of theological fact sort of de defeats the whole purpose of singing and can easily fall into dry intellectualism. But a good hymn, like Psalm 96, avoids both of those extremes by expressing both the heart's affection toward God and the reasons for expressing those affections. And so what, what then are the reasons that David gives for singing to the Lord? Why? Why ought we to sing to the Lord? Well, first, we sing because of the worthiness of God. He is worthy of the kinds of expressions found in this psalm. Well, why is he worthy? Well, his very nature and character are worthy. He is great, and therefore he deserves praise, verse 4. In fact, the pagan gods are worthless compared to him, verse 5. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary, verse 6. Glory and strength are due his name, verse 8. He is righteous and faithful, verse 13. In other words, God is great, God is majestic, God is glorious and strong, God is righteous and faithful, and therefore he deserves expressions of praise and adoration and fear and trembling and rejoicing. But not only is God's nature worthy, he is also worthy of because, uh, because of what he has done. And David lists here in this psalm many of God's marvelous works, he says in verse 3. He saved us, verse 2. He made the heavens, verse 5. He is coming to judge the earth, verse 13. Each of these acts of God deserves our response, and so David proclaims such a response. But there's, a, there's another profound reason that our expressions of praise toward God are, 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 are given to us by David in this psalm, and it is also at the core of the progression of thought in this psalm. I want you to notice this. According to David, this singing is not supposed to take place just in isolated conclaves of God's people. Rather, he says in verse 3 that singing is supposed to take place among the nations, among all the peoples. Now, why is that the case? I mean, isn't it true that singing is only for the redeemed people of God? Is it not true that only God's people can worship him rightly? Is it not true that this singing is to God and for God? Well, yes, that is certainly true. Only the redeemed people of God can sing these kinds of things, and the primary audience of this singing is God. But David says here we are supposed to do this among unbelieving people. Why? Well, the reason we are to sing among the nations is not stated in this psalm overtly, not directly. But rather, David expresses it by means of the psalm's development through its three stanzas. And by the way, just as a side note, this is also the mark of a good hymn. 
A good hymn is not just a loosely connected, disorganized smatterings of expression of worship and theological statements. A good hymn is carefully composed in such a way that its central ideas aren't necessarily always directly stated, but rather they are developed through the course of the hymn, giving it a a, a richness and a depth in how it expresses profound, deep things about God. And that's what we find here in Psalm 96. And so how does does the psalm develop through the three stanzas? Well, notice that this command in the first stanza to sing among the nations and among the peoples progresses in the second stanza where the command is to ascribe glory to the Lord and it's given to the families of the peoples, all the nations of the earth. There's an expansion from the people of God singing among the nations in the first stanza to all of the nations ascribing glory to God in the second stanza. And so, how does that happen? Well, it happens because as God's people sing to him among the nations... As they bless his name, as they tell of his salvation, as they declare his glory, this serves as a powerful witness to the unbelieving world. It leads to the the, the peoples of the nations now joining in, being converted, joining in with the worship and praise and song of the people of God. You see, there is nothing more evangelistic than God-centered worship in which we bless his name, we magnify his glory, we delight in his splendor, and we recount his works of creation and redemption. And notice that this kind of singing and worship, this kind of singing that's a powerful witness, it's singing without changing what we sing or how we sing in order to attract or appeal to unbelievers. In fact, the song explicitly calls the pagan gods worthless. That doesn't sound very seeker-sensitive to me. No, what, what is the greatest witness to the unbelieving world is when we faithfully recite the works of the Lord in our worship and we respond rightly with our hearts, expressing these things verbally through our song. And so according to Psalm 96, we sing in worship because it helps us to express appropriate heart affections to the Lord in response to his worthiness, and that glorifies him, and it is also a powerful witness to the unbelieving world. But there's a second reason that we sing that I believe is often forgotten, overlooked, and ignored, but we see it embodied in Psalm 96 as well. I want you to notice a couple additional aspects of the development of thought in this psalm. And the first relates to what we just saw. The psalm progresses from God's people singing among the nations in the first stanza to all the families of the earth ascribing him glory in the second stanza. Now here's the question. Is that a present reality? Are all the peoples of the earth currently joining us in praising the Lord in song? Well, certainly not. In fact, this is even perhaps more surprising considering the special focus on the people of Israel in the Old Testament, the original audience of this psalm. For David to address All the families of the people praising God, instead of just one family, children of Abraham, might seem odd until, of course, we remember that although God did choose Abraham and his descendants as his special chosen people, he promised to Abraham that through this one family, one day God would bless all the families of the earth. And, of course, the Old Testament is filled with prophecies that indicate that one day All the nations will bow before the Lord. All the nations will sing praise to God. But even now, that hasn't happened yet. God's focus, even in this age, of course, is is to spread beyond just Israel to the Gentiles. But even now, all the families of the people are not praising God. They are not all being blessed. So when will that happen? 
Well, before we answer that question, consider how David further develops the psalm in the third stanza. He's moved from Israel praising God among the nations in stanza one to all the nations praising God in stanza two. Where does he move from there in stanza three? Look at verse 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. So now this is not just Israel praising the Lord or even all the nations praising the Lord. This is the very earth itself praising God. Is that happening now? Well, there's a sense in which the heavens declare the glory of God. That's certainly true, but the heavens are not glad. The earth is not rejoicing. The fields are not exulting. The forests are not singing for joy before the Lord. Scripture tells us that creation is groaning as a result of the curse. You see, like the reality of all the families of the people praising God, all the heavens and the earth praising God is something that is yet to come. And so when will all of these things take take place? When will all of the nations finally join us in singing? And when will finally all of the earth and the trees and the fields sing out for joy? When will that happen? We'll keep reading in verse 13. For he comes. In other words, the gladness of the heavens and the rejoicing of the earth and the roaring of the sea and the exalting of the field and the singing of the trees, all of these things are in response to the coming of the Lord. And so, which coming is this referring to? Well, keep reading. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So, what's going on here? Well, what's very interesting is that even this phrase, he comes, is not in the future tense in Hebrew. It's actually in the perfect tense, which is used to describe actions that have already taken place or that are considered as already have have been completed. But for David and the Hebrews singing Psalm 96, any sort of coming of the Lord was entirely future, but here they are singing about the coming of the Lord as as if it has already happened. And, And remember, a good hymn like this psalm is an expression of affection to the Lord in response to who God is and what he has done, and yet here they are responding to something that has not yet happened. Why would they do that? And even for us living in this age, living on this side of the cross, this side of the first coming of of Christ, even for us, the coming described here in Psalm 96 is the second coming of Christ. It is yet future. Christ did not judge the world when he came the first time. That will happen when he comes again. And so, in other words, the the reality of all the families of the people ascribing glory to the Lord and the reality of all creation praising the Lord is, is future. It will not come to pass until the Lord comes again to judge the world, which again is, is future. But but we're singing it as if it is happening right now. You see, it makes sense to sing in response to things that have already taken place, right? Like God created the world, and so we sing in response to that. Or God saved us, and so it makes sense to sing in response to that. And it makes sense to sing in response to present realities. God is great, God is majestic, God is glorious and strong, and so it makes sense to sing in response to those things. But why would we respond to things that have not yet taken place as if they have already happened? Which is what Psalm 96 does. Why would we do that? Well, the answer to that question reveals the second profound reason that we sing in worship. The first reason that we sing is expression. We respond to past and present realities about God's nature and works. And singing gives us a voice to express our hearts toward God in response to those things that we have experienced. But the second reason that we sing, 
which is highlighted when we respond to something that has not yet taken place, is that singing forms us. In other words, when we sing in response to something that has not yet happened, we are, in a sense, acting out that future reality, and in so doing, we are formed by it as if it is happening right now. It, it makes sense to, response to, to, re, to respond to something that we've already experienced. That, that experience comes first, we're formed by that experience, and then out of how we have been formed by that experience, we respond. That makes sense. But how can we respond to something that we have not yet experienced? We've not yet experienced all the nations of the earth singing for joy. We have not yet experienced all the earth praising the Lord. We have not yet experienced the Lord coming to judge the earth. How can David expect us to respond to those future realities? Well, this is actually one of the great powers of art. Art, like a song is a way of creating an experience that maybe we haven't actually even experienced for ourselves, but it artistically creates that experience so that it can form us as if we are experiencing it. For example, not one of us in this room, to my knowledge, has journeyed through Middle Earth, battled orcs, resisted the power of the One Ring, or defeated Sauron. Right? I don't think anybody. But in reading the Lord of the Rings, we can experience those things through the art as if we had done them ourselves, as if we are Frodo. And, and therefore be formed by those events as if we had experienced those even though we never have. That's what art does. This is the power of all art, literature, drama, painting, poetry, and song. They don't just allow us to express what we have already personally experienced. They also shape our responses through portraying powerfully formative realities that we maybe haven't really experienced for ourselves, but we experience through the art. And so this is why we would sing a poem about a future reality, but singing it as if it is happening right now. By singing about all the families of the people praising God and all of creation praising God and the Lord coming to judge the earth in righteousness and faithfulness, our hearts are shaped as if we are really experiencing those realities right now. It's, it's more than just an expression of hope that these things will indeed happen. Through the art, we are making the future momentarily present so that it can form us. And this is really, if you think about it, true for past and present realities as well. For instance, Israel at the time of David hadn't experienced for themselves the exodus from Egypt. And yet, there are many psalms that artistically recreate the exodus so that as people sang of that experience, they could be shaped by it as if they were actually going through the exodus. And of course, none of us have experienced any of Israel's history, but by singing an artistic a representation of those events, we can be shaped by them. Or to put it in, in, in terms of even a more recent hymn, this is why we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, even though it happened 2,000 years ago. We sing about the resurrection of Christ as if it happened today because we are making a past reality momentarily present so that it can shape us once again. And this is also why good songs don't just express things like praise and joy and thanksgiving and adoration. They also recount the reasons for those responses because by singing the reasons, we are further formed by them over and over and over again through the art. You see, today, Christians, I think, often recognize the expressive power of singing in worship. We know that, that songs give us a way to express our hearts to God, and they do. 
But Christians often fail to recognize the formative power of song. Songs both express and form. And so this is why we need to be careful to discern both what a song is expressing to determine whether what it expresses is accurate and faithful to Scripture, but we must also discern how a song forms our expressions to determine whether how it forms us is also faithful to Scripture. We ought to choose to sing songs in our corporate worship, not just because they give us a good way to express what is already in our, in our hearts. We ought to choose songs that form our expressions, that mature our expressions, that grow them and expand them in ways that would not necessarily happen otherwise. This is what this psalm is doing. This is what all good songs do. We are singing about past and present and future realities such that they all become momentarily present through the art, shaping our hearts to respond with affections to the Lord that are appropriate for those realities. And so this psalm does that. This psalm does that by recounting these past and present and future realities But it also does that through the artistic elements of the song. Remember, this is not just a prose narrative of who God is and what he has done. This is a poem. This is a work of art. This is a song. It uses various artistic devices to form and shape our minds and our hearts as we consider God's nature and works and respond rightly to him. Now, there are a lot of things, go, poetic things going on in this psalm that I wish we had time to unpack, and, and we don't. But I want to I point out perhaps one of the most significant poetic things that is happening in this psalm, because it really gets to the heart of the key core message of what this psalm is trying to do. The most common poetic device in Hebrew poetry is parallelism. And it's often captured well in our English translations. Someone once said that in Hebrew poetry, words don't rhyme, lines rhyme. And that's what we find here. In this psalm, the parallel lines are mostly grouped in pairs of two. We call this bicolons. And usually you can see this in your edition of the Bible when the second line is indented. That's showing you that there's a pair of parallel lines. That's a bicolon. These lines are parallel in that the second line restates the idea of the first line, but, it, but, it, but the restatement further develops the ideas of the first line. So look with me at the opening verses again. We see here several bicolons. Oh, sing to the Lord all, uh, a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. That's a bicolon. Verse 2, sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. There's another bicolon. Declare his glory among the nations and his marvelous works among all the peoples and so forth. The whole psalm progresses in this way with pairs of parallel lines. And so you can see that this is actually a fairly complex poem. David didn't just write this in 15 minutes in his garage. This is a carefully crafted, very complex poem that embodies these sorts of ideas. David is employing, as we saw earlier, groupings of three verbs to develop his ideas connected with parallel lines. It's a beautifully complex poem. And the whole psalm progresses in this manner with bicolons, parallel lines in pairs, until we arrive at verse 10, which until this point we've not looked at. Verse 10 is not a bicolon like all the other parallel lines in this psalm. Verse 10 is a tricolon. It's a group of three lines in parallel in which the second and third line further develop and expand the ideas of the first line. So let's look at this tricolon. Verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. The second and third lines further develop and expand the reality of what it means that the Lord reigns. Now here's a question. Why would David do this? 
Why would he compose a poem entirely comprised of bicolons only to toss a tricolon in in verse 10? Was that a mistake? Was that an accident? Hardly. David, like all of the authors of the Psalms, was an accomplished poet. He knew what he was doing. He composed these lines as a tricolon intentionally. Why? Well, because it sets apart these lines from the rest of the poem. This is David's poetic way of of highlighting and bolding and underlining and drawing stars around these lines. These lines, this tricolon in verse 10, these are the central key lines of the whole poem. These lines really are the only lines of the psalm that explicitly present the content of our song. And what is the content of our song? The Lord reigns. Remember, Psalm 96 was included in a collection of enthronement psalms which celebrate the kingly reign of the Lord, and that's the focus of this central tricolon. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. As I mentioned earlier, David originally wrote this psalm to dedicate the new tabernacle once the Ark of the Covenant had been successfully recovered from its captivity in pagan territory where the Philistines had placed the Ark in the temple of Dagon. And you remember what happened when they did that? They woke up the next day and the Dagon idol was flat on his face. All the gods of the people are worthless idols. The Lord reigns. The Hebrews later used this psalm at the dedication of the second temple after they had returned from exile in Babylon, after God had saved them from captivity from the pagans, once again demonstrating his superiority over the gods of the pagans. Tell of his salvation from day to day. The Lord reigns. You see, the whole context and purpose of this psalm is encapsulated in this central tricolon of verse 10, which David masterfully uses poetry to ensure that we will not miss his point. The Lord reigns. And even though all of these things that are in this psalm have not yet come to pass... David sang this song, and the Hebrews sang this song after their exile, and we sing this song today as if this is a present reality so that it shapes and forms us into a people who live in light of the reality that the Lord reigns. We sing a song like this so that it shapes our hearts, so that it causes us to sing, so that it causes us to sing a new song. And this brings us full circle right back to the opening lines of the psalm. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. What is this new song? Well, this new song is directly connected to the central purpose of the message of this psalm. This phrase, new song, appears five other times in the psalms and once in Isaiah, and each time is very similar to what we find here, a call to sing to the Lord a new song. But that phrase also appears two times in the New Testament, both in the book of Revelation, when Jesus the Lord comes to judge the earth. The first is in Revelation chapter 5. This is John's vision of heavenly worship when the Lord comes. Revelation chapter 4 describes the angels surrounding the throne of God and it relates the songs that they are singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, worthy are you, our Lord and our God. But then in chapter 5, John sees the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, a lamb standing as though he had been slain. John sees the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is proclaimed as the only one worthy of opening the scroll that would establish his right to rule the kingdom of God. 
And in response to that revelation, verse 9 of Revelation chapter 5 tells us that the angels and the elders sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed a people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests for our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You see, This new song is a song in direct response to the finished work of Christ on the cross and his worthiness to rule after he comes again. It is a song of the redeemed. In fact, when this song appears again in in Revelation chapter 14, it says in verse 3 that no one could learn that song except those who had been redeemed from the earth. You see, a new song is a song that rises out of the heart of one who has experienced the Lord's salvation, who has experienced the goodness and greatness of God, and even more specifically, one who sings, one who responds, one who worships as if the Lord is already reigning perfectly, as if he has already come to judge the world, as if all the families of the peoples are already ascribing him the glory to his name, as if the very heavens and earth and seas and fields and trees are singing for joy to him. It is a song that expresses right affection toward God in response to who he is and what he has done. It is a song that blesses his name. It is a song that tells of his salvation from day to day. It is a song that declares his glory among the nations. It is a song that shapes us and forms us and molds our minds and our hearts such that we cannot help but affirm and adore and sing, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Folks, this is the kind of songs we should be singing. Songs that help us to express glory and honor due to God's name. That is a powerful witness to the unbelieving world. But songs that make momentarily present what God has done in the past, who God is in the present, and what God will do when he comes again. And it makes those things momentarily present such that they form and they shape our hearts to express what God deserves the glory and the honor do his name. May we sing this kind of song. May we delight in this kind of song. The songs that are modeled for us in the book of Psalms like we find here in Psalm 96. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you that you have given us the gift of song. This wonderful gift that gives us a language for the expression of our hearts when words alone would just not be adequate. But we also praise you for your purpose that songs like this, songs that recount your your nature and your character and your works, that songs like this will form us in appropriate ways. Maybe when we aren't feeling rightly about you. Maybe when we don't quite know how we should be feeling We thank you for songs that tell us, that show us, that form us, that we ought to be responding to you in appropriate ways because you are worthy of it. And we praise you that songs like this are indeed a witness to the unbelieving world. We pray that our worship of you, our uncompromised biblical worship and song of you would be a witness to the people of this community that more and more might join with us And we do long for that day when Jesus will come again to judge the earth. And in that day, all the nations will sing for joy before you. And all the earth and the sea and the trees and and the field will sing for joy before you. We long for that day. And we pray that that day would come quickly. In Christ's name, amen.